Um, really want to thank the Lord for the admonishment from his word. Thank God for the warnings. Thank God for the refuge. And I really appreciate many things that was stated prior to my coming up by Brother Fiedler. Um, the word balance, that's a huge word. You know, I think one of the hardest things to balance, quite honestly, is something that Jesus was full of. I think the hardest thing for Christians to balance is something that Jesus was full of. And uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, all you got to do is go to John chapter 1, verse 14. And it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And it tells us that he, that word that was made flesh, was full of grace and truth. I think that's one of the hardest things to balance as God's remnant people. And uh, I appreciate that term, and I pray by God's grace that can be my experience as well as yours. As we prepare our hearts to go into our study today, the best way to do that, as has been our custom, is on our knees. And so let's pray together, and let's let the Lord speak to our heart. Father in heaven, we are so grateful. Another brand new day of life, another brand new day of health and strength another opportunity to hear heaven speak. Thank you, Lord, for the gems you gave us this morning, for those of us who applied ourselves and had our morning manna. And Lord, I just praise you and thank you so much for just loving me and loving each and every one of us. And your desire is to reproduce that love in our hearts, that it will motivate us to do the master's will. Please, Lord, we pray, forgive us of our sins. Help us to have the mind of Jesus Christ through the power of the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. For this is our prayer that we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading uh, the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. An expansion on the Beatitudes. Okay, you look at the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and uh, that wonderful Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus was teaching, I mean, it was just wonderful things that he was revealing to his people. And it was in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 20, that I have found that this is more and still more becoming my reality. And it says in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 20, it says, The words of God are the wellsprings of life. As you seek unto those living springs, you will, through the Holy Spirit, be brought into communion with Christ. And then I love this next sentence. This has become my reality. Familiar truths will present themselves to your mind in a new aspect. Familiar truths will present themselves to your mind in a new aspect. It says texts of scripture will burst upon you with a new meaning as a flash of light. You will see the relation of other truths to the work of redemption, and you will know that Christ is leading you. A divine teacher is at your side. We must get to work for the master. The night is coming where we know no man will be able to work. In fact, it's very interesting because, you know, one of the things that I, I really appreciate, I felt, you know, Brother Fiedler had done a better job than I did. Uh, you know, that's my estimation. But you will remember our opening subject when I came here on Monday is we talked about how we see both the papacy and we see the evangelical world really be becoming more and still more engrossed in the healing work. And we talked about how they're going to use that as a catalyst to win the confidence of the people to ultimately say that we need to do something so that we can address all these calamities and all these different problems. And here it is that once again I was hearing those same sentiments echoed. God really is trying to help us see time is running out. And when we see time running out, we need to be more and still more about our father's business. And as I'm listening to that and standing in full agreement of that, the spirit of God began to flash 
like light, certain texts to my mind. I want you to look at a few of them with me, and we'll start with the book of Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, and I'm going to need a reader. I was hoping, I don't know if uh, any members of the O'Brien family, if anyone would be so kind to read for us, because I'm going to have you read a paragraph for me. I prayed and asked, Father, who should I have read? And the O'Brien family kept coming up. So, you know, I'm going to be obedient to that. So anyone who's willing to read. But in Matthew, the seventh chapter, and I'll let you know when it's time to read. We're going to read from a statement here in this little book called Gospel Workers. In Matthew 7, it's a familiar text of Scripture, but it's worthy to be paid attention to. It says in Matthew 7, we're looking at verse 21. And if you're there, just please say amen. It says in Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, obviously doeth. That's, that's an action word. So he that doeth. Now in verse 22, the people respond. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? Prophesied in thy name. And in thy name have cast out what? Devils. And in thy name done many wonderful what? Their works were wonderful. Their works were wonderful. And they did much of it. Is that right? They did much of it. They did a whole lot of work. They're throwing back their works. They're throwing back their efforts. They're throwing back their proclamations. They're giving this all back to God saying, these things are meriting our right to be into the kingdom. Then he says in verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that what? Ye that work, but it closes with iniquity. They were workers. <clears throat> Jesus did not deny their work, but he summarizes it as workers of iniquity. Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we see something else that is very interesting. Matthew we're looking now at the 24th chapter. And when we're in Matthew 24, we're going to give good attention to verses 44 to 51. Matthew 24, and now we're considering verses 44 to 51. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, starting at verse 44, if you there, say amen. amen. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise what? Servant. Servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil what? Servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What did those two groups have in common? They were both servants. They were workers. Works are absolutely imperative. You cannot possess the gospel in your heart truly and not be a worker for the master. That's impossible. We cannot have the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts and at the same time hate our brothers. It's impossible. The Bible is very clear in Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, for therein, that's the gospel, in the gospel, it says the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. If I have the gospel, it's going to be revealed in my works. No question about it. That is like super, super ABC simple. If the gospel's in your heart, it's going to be revealed through your works. The problem is, is that if we have received the gospel wrong, then more than likely we'll probably even reveal our works in a wrong manner. And we can end up suffering with blind spots. Now, I don't know about you, but when you drive a car, it's important to see what's in front of you. But sooner or later, you've got to switch a lane. And when you switch that lane, you got to pay attention to the blind spot. And if you and I don't pay attention to the blind spot, we could turn into a right lane where a Mack truck's coming. 
And that can change our whole human destiny. God wants us to pay attention to blind spots because sometimes those blind spots can even be more important than the thing that's right in front of our face. And so it is that when God looks at a worker, he's paying close attention to our works, but there's something he's paying even more close attention to. Go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, and now, O'Brien family, I need to get my reader ready. You're not going to read 1 Samuel 16, but you're going to read what comes after. In 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, Samuel has been sent on a mission, and his mission is to anoint the next king. Saul has obviously disqualified himself, and so Samuel finds himself at Jesse's house. Jesse has several children, and as Samuel begins to scan the landscape of his children, you know how we are as human beings. We make a lot of judgments by what we see. And so he did the same. So when he sees one of Jesse's children come along, and obviously he's tall, stout, you know, he has the image of a king, quote unquote. As he begins to think in his heart, surely this is the one that the Lord once anointed. God interjects and God gives a thought to not only Samuel, but to all of humanity. And this is why we have to pay attention to this past truth that's really present truth. It says in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. That's so clear. For man looketh how? On the outward appearance. But the Lord does what? He looks on the heart. There's something God actually pays more attention to than merely our works. He pays attention to our motives. I want you to listen very carefully with me as I have my young friend read for us from uh, Gospel Workers. And in this book, Gospel Workers, I want you to just read this paragraph. Who's, oh, you're going to read for me. Beautiful. I want you to read for me this paragraph right here. Oh, yeah, come on up. This is my sister and your sister. Amen? All right. My sister O'Brien. Tell us your first name. Grace. Gr now, what kind of name is that? That's a beautiful name, Grace. This is Sister Grace. And Grace is going to read to us something that comes right from that mercy seat. And I want you to understand what God is trying to say to all of us. My sister, go ahead and read that right there, from there to there. This is Gospel Workers, page 267 for all of our note takers. Go right ahead. The approval of the master is not given because of the greatness of the work performed, but because of fidelity in all that has been done. It is not the results we attain, but the motives from which we act that weigh with God. He prizes goodness and faithfulness above all else. Thank you very much, my sister. So I want you to listen to that very carefully. The approval of the master is not given because of the greatness of the work. Like perhaps many of you, I want to do something great for God. God has done something great for me. So naturally, I want to do something great for him. And sometimes we get so caught up in doing something great for God that God says that, don't worry, it is impossible to possess, it is impossible to have the Holy Spirit within our hearts and not do something great for God. That's not an issue. God just wants to make sure that we have a heart that can be trusted with the treasures of heaven. And so it says, the approval of the master is not given because of the greatness of the work performed, but because of loyalty, the loyalty, the fidelity in all that has been done. It is not the results we attain, but the motives from which we act that have weight with God. That's what he's really looking at in addition to our works. This is how you can have people that are going to say, have we not done many wonderful works and still be lost? This is how individuals can be considered servants for the master, but yet Jesus will have to let them know you were a servant, but you were an unfaithful servant. Works are absolutely imperative. Works are, in fact, a natural byproduct. In the truth of the matter, have you ever seen, you know, this is a good place to be because obviously there's a farm here. You know, you would never see grapes growing off of a corn stalk. And you won't see corn growing off of a grapevine. You won't see that, my brothers and sisters. 
If we're connected to the vine, we cannot help but to produce the fruit that comes from the vine. You understand? That's so incredibly simple. And I like simple. And what God is trying to say to each and every one of us is that if you're connected to me, there's no question you're going to do great works. Jesus already told us many great works you shall do, even greater works than me. You're going to have a greater, wider influence and sphere than even I had. So if we're connected to him, that's not a problem. The question is, are we connected to him? That's really the question. Otherwise, we can do a work in such a way that instead of assisting God in the reproduction of his character, we can end up thwarting the gospel by a reproduction in people of our own characters. And I can guarantee you the world does not need another Dwayne Lemon. You know, those of us who are starstruck and caught up into a lot of preaching, teaching, you might say, oh, no, we need a lot more Dwayne Lemons, Randy Skeets and everybody else. But I guarantee you, if Brother Skeet was standing right here, he would say the world does not need another Randy Skeet. I can guarantee you, Brother McNulty is going to say the world does not need another Norman McNulty, doesn't need another Dave Fiedler. What the world needs is what it needed 1900 years ago. Now we would say 2000. And that is a revelation of Christ. That's Ministry Healing 143. That's what the world needs. It doesn't need another Dwayne Lemon. It doesn't need another great evangelist and you can put their name to it. I don't want to reproduce another me because I got issues. Guess what? You don't want to need to reproduce another you because you got issues. We all have issues. And Christ is drawing us to his heart that we might be more and still more like him. Now, that is part of the work of gospel work. Doing gospel work doesn't mean that you and I have to be perfect before we engage. Gospel work is a means by which God draws us closer to his heart. So that's why we can never say, well, until I become perfect in every way, then I'll get involved in gospel work. Well, God forbid, that's not the message. But there should be some manifestation. There should be some indication that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and I believe in his truth for this time. I don't think it would make sense to send a Sunday worshiper to go tell everybody about keeping the Sabbath. Would that make sense? That would make absolutely no sense. What would make sense is that that individual studies, shows themselves approved, accept the seventh day Sabbath, now go tell somebody that. Doesn't that make sense? So there should be some level of development in an individual's life before they're engaged in gospel work as well. You understand that? Balance. There should be some evidence of surrender before they get into the work. And then as they engage in the work, they'll become a more deeper surrender. Does that make sense? And so it is that what God is trying to say is that motive with him means everything because that ultimately is the reason why he entered in 1844 and he still hasn't come back, though it be 2017. A lot of work has been done. A lot of outposts have been set up. A lot of sanitariums have been set up. And a lot of present truth has been proclaimed. My brothers and sisters, there's something greater that God is looking for. God knows I can't let nobody in my house unless they have a heart like mine. And so motive becomes a very important thing for us to focus on when we do our work. A husband can do great work for his wife, but the larger question is, why do you do it? Do you know there are certain men that can actually show love to their wives, but the only reason they do it is so that they can have certain selfish desires fulfilled at a later time? That's real. There are certain children that can go ahead and mother and father comes home from work and they see that child washing dishes. The parents are perhaps in shock, depending on what kind of home you got. Looking at their children, you washing dishes and I didn't have to tell you? Children are like, oh, yes, mommy and daddy, you know, I saw those dishes there, I just had to wash it. <laughs> parents are in heavenly awe. The parents are saying, oh, praise the Lord, look at that, God is getting a breakthrough in the heart of my children. But then mother and father at some point in the day sit down on their couch and they begin reading. And that child comes and says, um, there's something that I saw in the store. <laughs> and... I wanted to know, is it all right if I can get that? I mean, you know, I, I cleaned up the house. Good work, selfish motive. It is very easy for these things to creep up in a house. Rather than understanding that every child is called to honor their father and their mother, and part of keeping that fifth commandment is to lighten the burden of the parent. Rather than just doing it purely for that reason, some children sometimes serve even mommy and daddy and have selfish motives. 
My brothers and sisters, selfishness is in the heart of each and every one of us. Yes. And our hearts are very deceitful. And many a times we can even prepare for the final crisis. And we can be doing it from a selfish motive. That's why the question is asked, what's your motive for preparation? You know, we, we've talked about it this week. We talked about the nearness of the Sunday law. We talked about the mark of the beast. We talked about the uh, ecumenical movement. We talked about, you know, the powers coming together. That's ultimately going to set up an image to the beast that will inflict the mark of the beast. We talked about the apostasies and challenges that are happening in the church. We talked about a lot of problems that helps us see time is almost finished. So we obviously need to prepare to meet our God, but what's your motive? What moves you to get into the country? What moves you to get off of sad and get onto glad when it comes to your diet? What's your motive? Now, the reason why this is important is because I want you to watch what the Bible says. You see, the Bible makes it very clear. In John 14, 15, the text says it very clearly. If ye love me, do what? Now, when John the Revelator said, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. That means that every single one of those people that are counted amongst the patient saints are people who are deeply in love with God. Because that's the only way they could keep it. Does that make sense? Yet it seems like talking about love is corny. It seems like it's weak, depending on what group you're in. And sometimes we feel like if a Sunday law statement or if a, a final, crisis, final crisis term is not mentioned, then all of a sudden it's not present truth anymore. I don't know where people get these strange theories from. I was sitting talking with my fellow evangelists and we, we were talking about it. It's amazing. You can post something on Audioverse that says the next, the final step of the papacy. And man, that thing will get a thousand hits in a day. But if you go ahead and you put on that same audio verse and put our need for the love of Jesus, you might get to the number one listen to slot, but as fast as you're there, it'll drop right back down and you'll be put under everybody else who's talking about the next movement of the papacy. It's like we love to observe the beast more than the lamb. And what I'm trying to say, you see, I can say that. You know why I can say that? Because I have hundreds and hundreds of proofs of sermons that I've dealt with the beast power. In other words, I know about the movements of the papacy. I understand a lot of those things. But what I'm realizing is the more and still more that I come in contact with the cold-hearted present truther, it helps make it very clear that a lot of us, while we're aware of the movements of the papacy, we're not as aware of the movement of God in the most holy place trying to reproduce his character in you and me so he can get us off this planet and we can finally go home and be with him. And that's an issue. I, in fact, will tell you that's not an issue. That's a crisis. That's a real crisis. And so the question is, do I love God? And if you do, what does that look like? How do you constitute that? What, what makes that what it is? As my uh, spiritual father figure says, put some skin on that statement. What do you mean by that? And so it is, the Bible is very clear. If you love me, that's why you keep my commandments, right? Then, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. When it says the end of the commandment, does it mean that the commandments have come to an end? No. When you look at that word end, it actually means end result. The end result of God's commandments is love. It's God's love being put within the heart that motivates to Christ-like action. You understand that? Okay, now watch this. We now crown those two verses with this statement. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's what? Matchless love, revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. And the sight of him attracts. You remember yesterday I told you, I said, I'm a man. 100% man, but I said, but I find Jesus to be attractive. You understand that? The sight of him attracts my brothers and sisters. The more you behold Christ is the more you see, oh my, if I could only be like him. And it says it softened. Now here's the test if we are beholding 
the matchless love of God. It says it softens and subdues the soul. You ever met a hard Ventist? You ever met individuals who are very hardcore, very rule oriented, and very dogmatic and very, very minimized, yea, weak in grace and mercy? A lot of times we can become very hard because sometimes, like I told you, in that balance, we have sometimes more law than grace. Jesus was the master at balance because he was full of grace and full of truth at the same time. This is the goal that God is trying to get us to, not to become so filled with grace and mercy that we forget and minimize and dumb down God's law, whether it be moral or physical. But we don't want to become so law abiding that once somebody errs, we are ready to cast them off rather than demonstrate grace and mercy. This is the, the, as simple as the concept is, this is not easy to practice. This is not easy to practice. And that's why I thank God. He said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. I thank God because that's our test. Because any farmer knows, anybody who does farming and gardening, you know. A tear is a weed. And weeds grow to indicate defi deficiencies in soil. That's why the weeds grow. The weeds are letting you know that soil needs more phosphorus, that soil needs more calcium. It needs more of something. God allows those tears to still be in our midst so that we can see what the soil of our heart is deficient in. We can see the weaknesses in our characters. Messages to young people, page 117, the trials of life are God's workmen revealing unto us the roughness and impurity of our own characters. Remember that? And so God allows those trials to come to help us see things. But the more that we behold the Savior's matchless love, the sight of him attracts. It softens us. It subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice and they follow him. You see, what is it that makes you say or decide we need to get our house in order? If you wait to see hurricanes come and then you say, oh man, time's almost, we need to get our house in order. As good as that may sound, the fearful element is, what if you have a reprieve for the next five years and there's not a single hurricane? Do you fall back asleep? If somebody says, uh-oh, Trump has made a decision to make a change with the Johnson Amendment law. Trump has made a decision for et cetera. Pope Francis has made a decision to do, and he goes on. It's like many of us are saying, well, I need to get my house in order because these events are happening. The question is, what if those events don't happen? Do you fall back asleep? And for a lot of God's people, that's exactly what has happened to us. That's exactly what has happened to us. Listen, I remember times when I was told the Sunday law is coming through Bush and John Paul II. I mean, I remember that. Clear as day. And so it is that I was like, man, we got to get our house in order. You know, and you, and you, you, know, you start moving in, in, in frantic order and trying to get your house together. And then what happens is John Paul dies, Bush goes down, and life continues. And the question is, what happens to your urgency? You understand that? I mean, I, I promise you I know what I'm talking about. Me and God talked about it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you I know what I'm talking about with this. How do I know what I'm talking about? Should the shortness of time be our great motive for seeking righteousness? Should the shortness of time? Listen. The short, now, when the prophet makes this statement, that means that this was happening. Okay? The way, you, you watch the language. Okay? Now watch this. She says, the shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. So this is something that was happening. Okay? She says, the shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. She says, this should not be the great motive with us. Why? For it savors of selfishness. The very thing Brother Fiedler just showed us is foundational to sin. Is the very thing that depending on how you respond to the impending doom or crisis that's coming, it literally can cement us in selfishness in the name of preparation for the final crisis. That's dangerous. Now, I like these words. You know what words I like in this statement? With us. 
It's, in other words, there should be something with us that the impending realities of the Sunday law crisis does not need to be my great motive to move me. It's kind of like when God would say these things are an abomination unto you. Remember when God would say that in Deuteronomy 14, Leviticus 11? When he would say these pigs and, and shrimp and lobster, he would say they are unclean to you. You know why I like that? Because whenever my uh, other church members, you know, when my friends from other churches, when they come to me and say, Brother Lemon, you teaching clean and unclean, Romans 14 says there's nothing unclean unto itself. I say, amen. And they look shocked because they think and they trap me. They're thinking this brother teaching unclean animals. And I just told him from the New Testament in Romans 14, I believe it's verse 14. And it actually says that there's nothing unclean unto itself. And they said, so what do you say to that? I said, amen. I said, my brother, listen, if a pig gets next to another pig, there's nothing unclean unto itself. But Deuteronomy 14 and, De and Leviticus 11 says it shall be unclean. It shall be an abomination to you. So I say amen. A pig is not unclean to itself and a pig is not unclean to another pig, but it's unclean to the children of God. Are you a child of God? You understand that difference? This should not be the great motive with us. We should know better. It says this should not be the great motive with us. It says because it saves us of selfishness. We're going to start thinking about how to protect me and mine. You see, what did Jesus do when he saw prophecy being fulfilled? Mark chapter 1. Let's look at what Jesus did. Do you want to be like Jesus? You want to be like Jesus, don't you? I want to show you what Jesus did when he saw prophecy being fulfilled. It's right there in the Bible. Mark chapter 1. The Bible says in Mark, the first chapter, right there, <coughs> chapter 1. Notice what it says in verses 14 and 15. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. So did Jesus see prophecy being fulfilled? Yes, yes he did. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. When Jesus saw prophecy being fulfilled, he availed himself more to the masses to give the warning that we need to come closer to God. You understand that? So when I see prophecy being fulfilled, I'm not going to be more engrossed in getting myself in a quote unquote place of safety, I should already have been in a place of safety. And what I'm going to do is go out to others and show them how to find their refuge in Jesus Christ. The more you see prophecy being fulfilled is the greater call to gospel work. Not selfish preservation. Do you understand that? So as she says, that ought not be with us. It saves us unto selfishness. Then she asked the question, it's quite rhetorical. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us, that we may be compelled to write action through fear? It ought not to be so. Why? Jesus is attractive. I told you. The problem with many of us is Jesus is not attractive yet. And therefore, we got to keep hitting subjects. Because sometimes subjects are more attractive than Christ and his character. And so it says, it ought not to be so with us. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. Where did all this come from? Lift him up. Page 98, paragraph 3. It says, he proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. He says to us, I am the Lord thy God. Walk with me, and I will fill thy path with light. Jesus, the majesty of heaven, proposes to elevate to companionship with himself those who come to him with their burdens, their weaknesses, and their cares. He will count them as his children and finally give them an inheritance more value than the empires of kings, a crown of glory richer than has ever decked the brow of the most exalted earthly monarch. You see, when Christ and his character becomes attractive to us, when the love of God begins to be the thing that keeps pulling us more and still more up every round on Jacob's ladder, I will even address the nearness of the Sunday law crisis differently. 
We don't negate. Listen to what I'm saying, family, because I, I try to keep it as balanced as possible, but it's amazing how people still hear stuff. What I'm trying to say to you is not stop giving the warning. I'm not saying that. I am not saying that. We need to sound that warning very crystal clear. But my brothers and sisters, I've never seen a reformation take place because of a warning. I've never seen a reformation take place merely because of the warning. It is because of the call connected to the warning. You see, when you look at the third angel's message in Revelation 14, many of us get stuck on 9 to 11. But we need to start dwelling a lot more on 12. 9 to 11 simply says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's 9 to 11. It's all warning. The refuge is found in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. We are to give the warning, but the warning does not protect you. It is the refuge that protects you. And so we have to give the warning, but we also have to show that refuge in a most mighty manner because that's the deliverance. Think about that wise man, Solomon, when he said in Proverbs 22, I'm sure you remember the text. In Proverbs 22, Solomon said it like this. The prudent man. What's another word for prudent? Wise. So he's wise. So, the, so what made him wise? Watch this. The prudent man, the wise man, foresees the evil that comes. Now, I thank God the verse didn't just close right there. Because many of us behave like that's where the verse closes. In other words, you're not wise because you can see the evil coming. That's not the wisdom key. That's not the wisdom point. You know what the wisdom point was? The close of the verse. It says the prudent man, the wise man, foresees the evil that comes and he hides himself. It says, but the simple pass on and they are punished. What made the man wise? It's the fact that, yes, he saw the danger, but most importantly, he saw the refuge. And he hid himself there. The more that I see those dangers, it's imperative that we are under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. We are under that grace of God. We're under that power of God that is the only thing that can protect us. It's so simple. And so God wants us to understand that, yes, we need to sound the alarm. And I'm saying it again because I know, I know, I, I think I can see what will happen uh, after this message. I've been hearing the winds. I've been hearing the winds. My, I, I have former friends now. You know, it was a time they were my friends. No, seriously, it hurts. It was a time people called and said all sorts of great things. We pray with each other. And now there's these things going around and saying stuff. And, and I know when I say this. Forget about it. But you know what? I don't care. No, I really don't care. I'm hurt. But in the context of my I don't care is not that I'm just careless. What I really mean by that phrase is that I cannot let their not friending me and back by. I can't let that stop me from what God is making plain from his words. I can't let that stop me. I didn't get into this movement to be a whole, you know, sing kumbaya with all the present truth brethren. It's like I didn't do that. I joined this movement to learn of God and his ways and to give his truth as it is in Jesus. And I believe this with all of my heart. And one of the reasons I believe this is because I used to be in that camp. Oh, man, I used to be in that camp. And, you know, and, and it's a blessing. My wife will tell you sometimes we, if we're in London or someplace else, even here in the U.S., and people will come up and they'll say, Brother Lemon. And I say, yes. They said, uh, you're different. I'm like, same nose. Same eyes. Yeah. I mean, what do you mean I'm different? It's the same Dwayne Lemon. Yeah, maybe a little bit pounds less, a little bit. But you know, I'm all right. No, you're different. What do you mean I'm different? You don't preach the same. What do you mean I don't preach the same? Before it was shotgun. Before it was, you know, coming in real strong, et cetera. But now it seems like I hear more compassion and these type of things. And I said, well, if you see that, then praise God. 
if you see that. I don't want to negate the message, my brothers and sisters. I can't do that. It's too late in Earth's history. And I don't believe that sins in our church need to be called out on YouTube. If I'm not going to tell you what my wife did that's wrong, we should not be telling the world what God's wife does wrong. I stand on that. It's like, listen, I'm not saying that we don't have to address issues, but this is our family. How about we cut the cameras off and let's have some family talk. You cut those cameras off tomorrow, we will have family talk doing Q&A. But if we're going to put this on World Wide Web, I'm not putting my family's business out there like that because that's none of their business. And I get that from the Bible and I get that from the spirit of prophecy. You understand that? So God is just trying to help us understand we need a purification of motives. And it's not just gospel workers, it's medical missionaries. Did you know that even in medical missionary work, if we're not careful, our motives can be corrupted. Simon Magus saw healing taking place. And he said, oh boy, oh boy. I found a new way to bring in some cash flow. He didn't have a problem with people being healed as long as it was going to prosper him. You understand that? It is possible that we can even do medical missionary work. That's why, I don't know if Brother Fiedler brought this word out yet um, with Isaiah 58, but it's, it's, it's often mentioned in inspiration. She talks about disinterested service. That's a very important word. Disinterested service. Meaning nothing comes back to me. I am here to do this for you, looking for zero in return. Now, should that govern all and every aspect of medical missionary work? Oh, you sound weak. Should that govern all and every aspect of medical missionary work? No. There are cases and situations where an individual has a right to be compensated because they have given their full time, full energy, full effort into this work and they gotta go home and make sure they have food on their table too. Can you imagine, they, you know, here they are helping everybody else and all right, go home and eat. And then you're like, okay, um, you gonna go home and eat? Nah, why? Well, I don't have any food, I don't have any money, I don't have anything. But you go home and you eat. That's not what I read in God's plan. God's plan works for everybody. It is okay at times to say, here is a humble fee for the service that will be given by which we can help you and we can receive support that enables us to take care of ourselves so we can keep helping others. There's nothing wrong with that, you see? But the problem is, is in our history, it got to a place even in medical missionary work. You remember in 1 Samuel 8 when Israel revealed their problem. Israel had a problem in 1 Samuel 8, didn't they? Their problem was they were looking at all of those other nations and noticing all of them got kings. Why don't we have a king? Samuel says, your king is God. They said, not enough. Your children, your children are all messed up, Samuel. They're not, they're not acting right. You about to die. And all these nations appear to us to be prospering because they got kings. We want a king. God says, Samuel, hold your peace. They didn't reject you. They rejected me. And then God begins to work with them. Can you imagine? I tell you, that's the forbearance of God, isn't it? God not only says, okay, I'll give you a king. God says, I'll not only give you a king, I'm going to instruct the king on how to be a good king. And God let them see how badly they failed. And that's why later on, they said, we have sinned in that we have asked for a king. <laughs> Israel saw that. Amazing. Well, here it is that the same way Israel was stargazing at the world while they had their kings, there was a time in medical missionary work they began to look at the prosperity of other, other medical practitioners. They started seeing man. You know, it seems like in seven-day Adventism, that's one of the places where you can find uh, a lot of medical practitioners who uh, don't look like some of the medical practitioners in the world. You know, some of these medical practitioners in the world are pulling out with, you know, these expensive cars, living in big plush houses and et cetera. But when you look at a lot of medical practitioners in, in seven-day Adventism in certain places, you know, you see that their lifestyles are far more humble than that. Well, sometimes... Medical practitioners in the days of our pioneers began to gaze a little bit at doctors and look at how much money they were making and looking at different things and 
getting distracted. They started to see certain things happening in the institutions, and they got to a place where they would start raising prices to exorbitant numbers, where it was no longer sensible. And it got so bad that the prophet of God had to lift up her finger and write about it, and here's what she said. And again, we're talking about motive. Medical missionary work is a what kind of thing? It's a sacred thing of God's own devising. We are not to cover mercy with selfishness and then call it medical missionary work. Question, how do you do that? Get, come on, let's put some skin on this statement. How do you do that? How can somebody cover mercy with selfishness, but yet they call it medical missionary work? Give me a practical example of what that looks like. That is an opportunity for you to respond, yes. Okay, so we will come. Now, did we establish earlier that it's okay to ask for a fee? Okay, so we don't want to say that necessarily because we might indict very faithful workers who are doing it right. Okay, overpricing. We still got to qualify that a little bit. Yes? Okay, so if someone can't afford it, we should do what we can to avail ourselves to help them anyhow. I like that. I like that. Anything else? Prestige. Did you say a neurologist? <laughs> now, we know that that's not that neurologist, right? Because I'll tell you right now, from my own professional and personal view, that is a consecrated neuro neurologist. Amen. amen. So we're not talking about you, Brother McNulty. You, you, amen. You're talking about somebody else. Brother McNulty will have a talk with them. The point is, it is possible that we can do works of mercy with a selfish underlying behind it. Let me go ahead and avail myself to help in this area as long as I get something. And if you don't give me something, I will not show up, even though I have time to show up. There are many ways that we can cover mercy with selfishness. And we have to understand that God is not pleased. In fact, watch this one. The institutions that depend upon God and... Now, notice this point. This is very important here. And our institutions today can learn from this. The institutions that depend upon God and receive his cooperation must ever work according to the principles of his law. To charge a large sum for a few minutes work is not just. It says physicians who are under the discipline of the greatest physician the world ever knew must let the principles of the gospel regulate every fee. Let mercy and love of God be written on every dollar received. That means you cannot treat health guests like numbers. You know, one of the things I love about the sanitarium work, unfortunately, our medical practitioners who are in the system of today, the truth of the matter is, is that there are some who are cognizant to the point that they know I'm in a trap. There's a lot more I want to give my patient, but I just can't because I'm under a system that does not allow me to do that. And that's why if you talk too long with your doctor in the traditional medical system, if you go to that clinic or what have you and you visit them, if you're talking too long, they're going to start doing this. Yeah. And the reason why is because there's a productivity pull. They need you to see more people. And so they got to do their rounds. And hence, they're going to see you for a few minutes. And then after a while, okay, and they got to move on to the next person in comparison. Sometimes you sit down with a gospel medical missionary evangelist, and sometimes they're doing a one-on-one -on -one lifestyle consultation, and that alone can take two hours. Because some people got lifestyles that are just so bad that you really got to go through point by point and step by step to eventually get them to God's solution. Sometimes when we go to the sanitariums, and I've seen this, I've seen this, I've seen this. When you go to those sanitariums, the way some of those workers work, it is nonstop. I mean, they are pulling and stretching themselves to the limit yes. to make sure that that health guest is getting what Christ would have given them had he been on this earth. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters, if that institution prospers financially, that's fine, because guess what? Mercy and the love of God is written on every dollar that's been received. But when we begin to treat people like numbers and we become careless and indifferent, my brothers and sisters, this is when 
we become impractical. I love that first part of the sentence. The institutions that what? Depend. Depend upon God. I don't know how folks do this. All I can say is, how does Jesus really feel about it? I haven't read anything. It's, and you know, I know there's others here who read more than me, so you, know, you can enlighten me. And I'm very serious when I say that. But I struggle with the idea of not helping somebody if they honestly and genuinely cannot come up with the fee. If they can't come up with that dollar figure, but they have been written off by their doctors and they need help, I don't know any justification that can go on in our minds that would make us say, I'm sorry, we cannot help you. I understand if we're packed. If we're packed, if we're full, and all of our workers are taxed and maxed out, I understand we have to tell people, listen, we can't, we can't help you, but go here. That's another thing I'm hoping that we get to see more is a cohesive relationship between the sanitariums. If I can't help you, hey, so-and-so, can you help them? If they can't help, hey, can you help them over there? No competition amongst the saints. You understand that? None of that represents God and his character. And it reveals perhaps our motives of why we do what we do. God wants us to understand when people need help, we got to do what we can to help them. And so God doesn't have a problem with people getting paid. There's nothing wrong with that. And guess what? People have a right to earn income in self-supporting work and to, if, if they're prospering in it. I was teaching a finance class to my children for homeschooling. We're doing biblical finances. And I began to show them, I said, children, we got to a, po a point in the class where we said, is it wrong to be wealthy, to have a lot of money, to be rich? I said, is it wrong? And my children, well, I don't know. And I was just like, no. And so we started to show them. We started showing them principles in the Bible, principles in the spirit of prophecy. There's nothing wrong with being rich. So one of my, <laughs> one of my sons, he, he, he wants to do big things. And here it is that he's looking at it. And he's like, hmm, OK. And so I said, all right. So I said, now, should we strive to be rich? Because he was like, you know, well, it seems like it's permissible to be rich. OK. So that's it. Should we strive? He was like, absolutely. If God allows us to be rich, then we should strive to be rich. Took him over to Proverbs, labor not to be rich. <laughs> Do you remember what Solomon said in Proverbs 30, verse 7, 8, and 9? Solomon said, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. And then he said, give me neither poverty nor riches. He said, just give me that which is sufficient for me. Amen. Wasn't that nice? That's, that's beautiful balance. So my son is like, Dad, then how do you reconcile? Don't labor to be rich, but yet it's OK to be rich. How do you do that, Dad? I said, it's very simple. I said, one day I was in Indonesia. And when I was in Indonesia, I was missing my bride from my side. I was missing my wife. And so they had internet service, so I was able to get to an internet service. This is 2010. And in 2010, there was this app that just came out. And this app was incredible because the app allowed you, as long as you had an internet connection, to communicate with anybody on planet Earth that had the same app. It was called WhatsApp. So I remember, I can see this, it's clear in my mind. I'm right there leaning against the wall, getting that feeble internet, because we was up in the mountains. And I remember that I was there, and I was like, are you there? And she would say, yes, I am. And I'd be like, how you doing? You know, so we start talking to each other. And I said, oh, how wonderful this is, that you could still communicate with your loved ones, even when you're on the other side of the planet. You know, what an incredible thing. So these guys go ahead and create this little app, and they want to go ahead and be a blessing to everybody. A lot of SDAs use that app. Even present truthers. I'm making this point for a reason. Five years later, 2015, WhatsApp caught the attention of so many people that Facebook said, we like this product. Facebook knocked on WhatsApp owners' doors and said, we'd like to buy your app. We'd like to have ownership of it. WhatsApp people said, what do you want for it? They said, we'll give you $19 billion. WhatsApp in five years became instant billionaires. They didn't labor to be rich, but they sure did end up rich. You understand that? 
And so I help my children understand sometimes you might create something that's just humble and all you want to do is just touch a few lies. But if that thing catches fire and catches all the people's attention, don't be surprised if it explodes. And you might end up in a situation where now you're going to be held in higher accountability before God. For to whom much is given, much shall be required. That's the balance. God wants us to understand Motive means so much to him. Motive, good motives should produce good works. Amen? Are there some people who have good motives but are doing things against God's commandments? And that's why there's an imperative need for study. There's an imperative need for study to show ourselves approved so we can clearly know God's instruction and then under righteous motive, go forward in that instruction. Make sense? So my brothers and sisters, the very, very key is this. All this week we've been talking about power. We've been talking about power. God wants to give us more power than we think, and most certainly than we have. But God wants to make sure that we can be entrusted with the riches that he wants to pour out on us. And this is why motive has to be a subject that we address. Because as we can see, it can affect and infect medical missionary work, general gospel work. It can affect us in every phase of life. And God has given us something that can help us with the purification of our motives. Because if the truth be told, some of us are still selfish in our home life. Some of us are selfish in our work life. Some of us are selfish in our ministerial life. And God wants to uproot that stuff. And the question is, what has he given and availed to us that can assist us in this process? The Bible says, again, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Do me a favor. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians, when we go to chapter 1, and I sure do love talking about this. 1 Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 1. The gospel of Christ is definitely the power of God unto salvation. No question about it. And I want you to notice what it says as we consider 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And if you're there, just let me know by saying amen. Amen. All right. In 1 Corinthians 1, notice what the Bible says in verse 17. The Bible says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach what? The gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the what? It's the power of God. So whenever we think of the gospel of Christ, we also must connect it with the power of God, which is the cross of Christ. Make sense? Now, going to verse 24, we see in verse 24, it says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, who? Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So it's not the cross by itself that represents the power of God. It is what was hung on the cross that represents the power of God. And that is none other than Christ. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross of Christ, there's something in that that has power. And the more that we understand that, it can demonstrate that power in yours and my life when it comes to our home life, when it comes to our work life, when it comes to our ministerial life. And so what God ever wants to keep in front of us is Christ crucified. You understand that? Now watch this. When we think about the cross, what took place on the cross? The blood of Christ was shed. Jesus died for us. Yes? Okay. And there's a lot entailed in that. Notice this. Colossians 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. That's what took place on the cross. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have peace. We have redemption through his blood. Then Ephesians 2 verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We have now been drawn closer to Christ. 
as a result of the blood of Jesus. Going on, Hebrews 10 and verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the where? Where is it that we're entering into? The holiest. holiest. Okay, the holiest, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, this became very interesting to me because there's a lot going on as a result of the blood of Christ. It helps us to obviously have peace with God, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We're drawn closer to God. And even as a result of the blood, it enables us to enter into the holiest. And so the blood of Christ becomes very central to every phase of Christianity, even the very last phase of Christianity, which is today the truth for this time, in the remnant. Now watch this. Started looking at this. Blood. According to the Bible, blood was in every phase of the sanctuary. You had blood in the courtyard, blood in the holy place, blood in the most holy place before the mercy seat. There's never any time that the blood of Christ was not present in the sanctuary services commingled with all of its lessons. In other words, God at no point never wanted us to forget the cross. At no point in history did he want us to become blindsided to the effect, the impact of Calvary. I remember in 2004 in Atlanta, there was a prominent preacher that came in town. And I remember, boy, that church was packed. I mean, hundreds of people came out. And he was very well known from California, and he was starting to preach the word. And as he began to preach, oh my, the church would say amen. And I mean, yeah, seriously, there had to be like 400 or 500 of us there. Amen, amen, he said everything. And then at one point in the sermon, he said, the cross is behind us. The most holy place is before us. And the church said amen. And it was like God stopped my tongue and said, think about what you just heard. The cross behind us, the most holy place before us. And he began talking about those who dwell upon the cross, but not the most holy place. And, and I remember I was like, ah, why is my heart not settled with that statement? God brought my mind back to Great Controversy 489. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, I like this word right here, by his death he what? Began that work. What work? What work? The? It was right there in the sentence, fam. This is an open book test. Look at it. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Essential to the what? By his death, he began that work. What work? The plan of salvation. You understand that? He began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to what? Complete in heaven. So notice that. On the cross, he began that work. In the sanctuary in heaven, he what? Completes that work. You understand that? See that balance? I remember one time a gentleman came to me. I was at AUC, Atlantic Union College, and he did not believe in sanctuary message, investigative judgment, and so on. We got a lot of people that's doing that nowadays. There's a prominent preacher. Unfortunately, he fell on a point of sin, and then after that, he's now become an enemy of the message an enemy of this message and, and the church and, and, he's right, and he's putting out challenges on Facebook, prove the investigative judgment and all these other things. And boy, I get so tempted. That's why I need to get off of Facebook. Y'all, whoever's on Facebook, fare thee well. You're about to see me take off because it's distracting. Well, here it is that this individual at AUC was there and he wanted to explain away the investigative judgment, the sanctuary and all these things. And he said, listen, I know that God will judge the wicked. He said, but there's nowhere in the Bible where God will judge the righteous. And he said, you Seventh-day Adventists believe that God will judge righteous people. And he was like, that's erroneous. God says in John 10, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And he started getting on me about this. And so when he said God will not judge the righteous, I said, are you sure? He said, oh, I'm positive. God will not judge the righteous. I said, Can I sh if I show you somewhere in the Bible where God says he'll do it, I said, would you change your position? 
He said, yes, I would. I said, all right, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and let's notice what the Bible says. Ecclesiastes 3, and I remember giving this to him. In Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, does God judge, right? There's only three groups of beings that get judged in the Bible. Angels, the wicked, and the righteous. It's easier to find the wicked and fallen angels because they're both in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 6. But where in the Bible does God say he will judge the righteous? Ecclesiastes 3, right there in verse 17. The Bible says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the who? Righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every word. Does the Bible say God will judge the righteous? Yes, he would. And then we had to go into when does God do that? Because there's a time that God judges fallen angels. There's a time that God judges the wicked. And there's a time that God judges the righteous. And as we started going through these things, it became so simple. Think about it. Where do you read that the blood makes atonement for mankind? The blood by itself makes atonement for mankind. Where do you read that in the Bible? I haven't read it. You're looking at me strange. In other words, there's a time and place to become a meticulous thinker family. I don't read that the blood independently makes atonement for mankind. What I read, you can read Leviticus 4, you can read Leviticus 5, you can read Leviticus 16, you can go throughout the Bible, you can read Hebrews 8 and 10 for sure. It's the priest that makes atonement. The provision that the priest uses is blood. You understand that? The blood by itself makes no atonement. It requires a priest. The priest has to take that blood and go into the holy place and the most holy place. And he has to sprinkle it before the veil. He has to rest the blood upon the horns of the altar. He has to do that. And then it makes atonement. So then I asked the question, when Jesus was on earth, was he our lamb or was he our priest? He was our lamb. When he ascended into the sanctuary, he became our priest. So then how in the world can we say everything was finished at the cross? Are you, are you thinking? It, it's not logical. If we understood all the types and shadows, it was the priest that made atonement. The blood is the How many of you, if I wrote you a check for $1 million, how many of you would be happy? You'd be happy? I wouldn't. I'd be curious, but I wouldn't be happy. You know when I'd be happy? When I take your check, I go to my bank and I deposit it. You understand that? When I deposit the check, and when my bank account goes from $1 to $1 million, $1. Now I'm happy. You understand that? Because I got the benefit of the check. You see, Christ, when he shed his blood on Calvary, it was a check written. It was a check written. We all have an eternal life check. But it has to be cashed in. And we need a priest to do that work for us. And so it is that Christ didn't finish the work at the cross. He began that work at the cross. And he completes it in the sanctuary above. You understand that? So that's a true statement what we're reading. So now let's continue with it now that we have understanding. It says we must by faith enter within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered. There, now watch this, enter within the what? The veil, whether the forerunner has entered there, which is the veil. And where's that? This would be most holy place. It says there the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. Are you telling me that the light from the cross of Calvary shines from the most holy place? Yes. Who does it shine on? It shines on you. It should shine on me. In other words, don't you ever make the mistake of separating the cross of Calvary from the most holy place. But you know what? Many of us do that because some of us know how to talk more law than we do 
grace, and we need that balance. You understand that? If we don't have that, we will be like the man who said, woe to the east, woe to the west, woe to everybody, woe to Israel. And when destruction to Jerusalem came, that same woe man died in the same siege that he foretold. That's what happened. And you know why? I know that brother couldn't have been a Christian. You know why? Because Great Controversy, page 30 says, not one Christian died in the siege. But he died in the siege. And he gave the warning. But he was not in the refuge. Those lessons are for us. All these things happened unto them for examples. My brothers and sisters, history has a tendency to be repeated. God says, where's your heart? Where's your motive? And one of the reasons why our motives often are messed up is because we're not allowing the light to shine on us. You see, this is the solution to many of the corruptions that are in our heart. God's people meditating upon the cross. Now watch this, we're gonna bring out some final points. There we may again, there we may gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. Think about that. There the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne. And through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith may be presented before God. My brothers and sisters, how often do you dwell on the cross? Homeschooling parents, how often do you mingle the teachings of the cross in your education to your children? <coughs> Morning worshipers, how often are you deliberate seeing the cross in everything that you study? Preachers and teachers of righteousness, how often do you show the principles of Calvary and how it can help us really stand true to God when every earthly support and all these other things are cut off? How do we serve people with only a genuine desire to serve people. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. The burden of my heart did roll away. Now watch this. The significance of the blood of Christ, it provides cleansing and it demonstrates sacrifice. Is that right? It provides cleansing and it demonstrates sacrifice. So when Jesus tells us to bear our cross, we understand that he wants to do cleansing in our own lives, and he calls us to sacrifice. Is that right? That's what he wants for us. That's what he wants for you, and that's what he wants for me. Whenever I think of bearing that cross, I know it's going to require a denial of self. Not my will, thy will be done, Lord. When it comes to how I treat my wife, I want to get, I'm mad at her, and I want to say something back. God says, remember the cross. Because God says, I could have been mad, and I could have said something back. Oh, my... Listen, I don't know about you, but the, these are super simple, absolutely powerful points once they're practiced. I'm serious. You can watch your whole home life, your ministerial life, your work life absolutely change if we can literally apply these principles. Look at this instruction from heaven. Let the cross, tell me if this is a suggestion or if this is an absolute command from the most holy place. Let the cross of Christ be the science of how much? All education, the center of how much? All teaching and how much study? All study. Do you see why I said preachers, teachers, homeschooling parents, etc.? Let the cross of Christ be the science of all education, the center of all teaching and all study. It says, let it be brought, the cross of Christ, let it, the cross of Christ, be brought into the daily experience and practical life. How do you do that? How do you bring the cross into your daily experience in practical life? And parents who have a burden for their youth, look at how it closes. So if we did this, so will the Savior become to the youth a daily companion and friend. Listen, I understand we've been beaten, battered, and bruised by broken human promises. But this is one human that keeps every single one of his promises. Jesus promises 
If you let the cross of Christ be the science of all education, the center of all teaching and all study, if you bring its principles into the daily experience and practical life, God says, I promise you, the Savior will become a friend, a companion to our youth. The problem is, is that I don't think we've mastered this science. That's the truth. It, it, as I looked at my life, the first time I read this, it smacked me in the face. I said, hold up. I don't do this. I don't do this. It made me test myself and examine myself, which Paul already told us to do, didn't he? Examine yourselves if you are in the faith. I mean, we've already been told these things. Literally, I started doing this. I, listen, the, my heart, uh, when my heart went down, you know, with all this stuff, I remember thinking, wait a minute, somebody else could one day marry my wife. It hit me one day. Seriously, it, it, I'm just being truthful. Listen, when a man thinks he's about to die, all sorts of stuff can go through his head. And I thought about that, I said, Lord have mercy. I don't want to think about this, <laughs> you know? You just kind of move on. But I remember thinking about, where have I erred as a husband? Where have I erred as a father? I went to this like massive assessment of myself. And as I went into this massive assessment of myself, I started thinking, you know what? I would like to leave a legacy. I would like to be able that though, if I were to sleep, my works can follow. And that I want my wife to be able to say he was everything a house band was supposed to be to me. If I ever had to go from this planet. I don't want her to be able to have to say he was a good man, but. Same thing with my children. I don't want them to say, Daddy, you know, he was a great dad, but. I would like to, by the grace of God, be the model of what God called a house band to be of what he called a father to be. You understand what I'm saying? That's very important to me. And that's always been important to me, but how much the more when I thought I was going to pass on, you know? And so the more that I started thinking about these things, I said, Father, have I demonstrated the cross of Christ in being a husband? Have I demonstrated it faithfully in being a father? And I started looking and assessing myself. Now, here it is, nine months post-surgery, et cetera. I mean, man, I really thank God that he has given me another opportunity to even do it better than it's already been done. I thank God for the other opportunities. And so it is that we have to understand, family, we're here today, gone tomorrow. None of us are promised tomorrow. And we should be able to leave an example before our spouses, before our children, before our fellow man, that they can say, when I think of him and when I think of her, I saw Jesus. I saw his love. I saw the principles of the cross demonstrated in his life, in her life, every single day. And so this thing became serious to me. So I started studying practical lessons from the cross. What are practical lessons that we can get from the cross? When I started looking at it, Matthew 16, 24, right? In Matthew 16 and verse 24, what's a practical lesson that we can get from the cross? Matthew 16. The Bible says in Matthew, we're looking at the 16th chapter. It was right there in the 24th verse. And the Bible says it very nicely. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Part of taking up the cross or bearing the cross is going to involve me denying myself. Things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 that I have a right to, that there are going to be times I need to surrender my right. Can you imagine that? Do you know how hard that is? For many of us, it's hard to just give up a right. How about when you have a right to do it? There's some things we have. I have a right to kill myself, but that would be pretty unwise. You understand that? That would be foolish. I'm not talking about those kind of rights. I'm talking about things that you have a right to do that maybe even the word of God is okay with it, but yet you won't do it for the sake of another. That's 1 Corinthians 8. That's a surrender the right right. You see, Jesus had a right to stay in heaven and say, let them sinners deal with their issues. He had every right, and he would have still been 100% just holy and true. Love motivated him to surrender his right and say, I will take their punishment and give them my reward. 
You understand that? That's why it's such a slap in the face of God when we actually endorse living in sin, violating his law, breaking his commandments. It's an absolute slap in the face because God says, do you understand how much I did to you? That the integrity of my law may be maintained. And now you take my grace and use it as a reason to violate my law. That is spiritualism. That is wickedness. That is sin. God wants us to understand. Denial of self, even the things you have a right to do. God says, for the sake of others who might be weaker than you, surrender your right. Practical examples. First lesson, denial of self. That's pretty general. Let's get very specific. Luke 22. Look at Luke 22 with me. Let's go through this. I want you to look at this. These are practical examples. We're, we're bringing it down. I'm just walking rather than running. Luke 22. Look at verse 60 to 62. Luke 22, verses 60 to 62. And I, I really appreciate this because this is what Jesus wants. He wants it to become more practical to us. All power is available to us. You need the Holy Spirit, I do. How do I get him? Ask. When I ask for the Holy Spirit, the Bible promises he will come and he will guide you into all truth. So as I open up the Bible and as I study, God is gonna show me truth. And then he's gonna say, walk in the light. What we do from that point is we do what Joshua did. We do what Elijah did. We do what Moses did. We choose to follow him under the power of God. Choose this day whom you will serve. Is the Lord be God? Follow him. I present before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. We choose to obey God because he gave us power to do that. And when we exercise faith, all other blessings will come in its train. Now watch this. Luke 22, verses 60 to 62, very practical lesson, is Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. The Bible says in Luke 22, 60 to 62, and Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine that Jesus warns you, I'm telling you, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. No, I won't. No, I won't. They might deny you, but I won't. So here it is. It happens. When he denies Christ the third time, remember, remember we, we think in pictures. When he denied Christ the third time, the Bible says his eyes connected with Jesus. Cock crows, his eyes connect with Jesus, and Jesus is looking right at him. Now, let's be honest. Have you ever told somebody, please stop doing that, or please don't do that, because if you do that, this bad thing will happen? They say, no, 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 it won't happen. And then they do the bad thing, and everything terrible that you warned them was going to happen, happens. When you finally reconnect with them face to face, Sometimes there's a temptation in our heart to say, didn't I tell you? Sometimes if that bad thing happens too immediately uh, after we've said that, then sometimes if they're looking at us in the face, we have a, te a temptation probably to say, you know, like, didn't I tell you? You know, body language, countenance, facial expressions. That's the, at least the human temptation. Would you agree? Yeah. While, the while the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips, and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears. The Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. When Peter looked at Jesus, he saw pity and he saw sorrow, but he saw no anger. I said, Father, can you save me? Listen to what I'm saying to you. I don't have that heart. If I warn you and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you do this, da 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 da, and, and, you're, and, you're, and your arrogance, 
You don't listen to me. And I'm like, I'm telling you. No, 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 I got it. And then you fall flat on your face. And then when you look at me and you don't even see in my face anger, all you see is deep pity, sorrow. You see a gentle countenance. I said, Lord, I'm not like that. Thirdly, I'm on my knees like, Father, I'm not like that. Can you really change my heart? I, I'm, I lied to you now. There's times that I talk to God. I'm, le I'm learning to talk to God in nature, like we talked about this week, talking to God in nature out loud. And I'm like, so you are going to take this mind and you're going to get me to become like this. I said, I want to see this. I want Because I'm not fighting him. I'm not trying to fight God. It's just that I've been through some stuff. And because of that, it's like, wow, a lot of the things of life kind of shape you. You know what I'm saying? So you start saying, so this is the perfect reflection you want to see in me before probation closes. I want to see how you're going to do this. I'm not going to fight you. I just can't wait to see this end product. I want to see how you're going to do this. Because God knows where I come from, the way he knows where you come from. You understand that? And then it says this. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness before the brother even said, Lord, I'm sorry. Jesus already had in his heart forgiveness reserved. He already, Peter did not confess his sin until later. You know that, John 21, when he said, Peter, lovest thou me more than these and, and all that. Jesus already had a look of forgiveness upon him. God says, that's a principle that I want to see reflected in your home. I want you to treat your husband like that. I want you to treat your children like that. I want you to treat your wife like that. God says, my love has enough power to purify your motive. I can show you how to not do a fake smile, but a real one. You understand that? God says, I can show you how to actually love people that even you will be surprised. You see, this final crisis is getting ready to come. <clears throat> if we really understood what we're getting ready to behold, what the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy is basically laying out before us is that we're getting ready to go through a dark ages, part two. If I can just put it like that. It's going to be a repeat of the dark ages, just with new technology. That same old hatred spirit that the first beast power has, it still has it. It's just held in check because it doesn't have the state to back it up yet. But the time will come when church and state are going to come right back together again. And when it comes back together again, what took place in the dark ages, we're going to see those things happen again. We're going to see it all happen again. And when I read Fox's Book of Martyrs, when I read these things of what God's faithful souls went through, and God says... These things will happen again. And here it is that we're going to be like Stephen. While stones are hitting us, we're going to look up and God's going to give us a miraculous blessed assurance. And we're going to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And we think that that's going to be some pop character quality experience when the Sunday law passes. And we just suddenly going to turn into a bunch of nice, loving people. God says this must be cultivated right now. And if we are not dwelling upon Calvary, if we are not looking to understand how does the cross and the most holy place, how do they come together? If we don't understand this, yea, master it. My brothers and sisters, we may come up to the crisis thinking we're all right like Peter. The only difference is there actually won't be a look of forgiveness. It's going to be too late. This one, it will be too late. And so today, if we're hearing God's voice, we need harden not our hearts. We need to say, Lord, I need you to reflect this in me. But the only way it can happen is you and I must dwell upon Calvary. Do you understand why Ellen White would say, let the cross of Christ, I'm sorry, not let the cross of Christ, but she talks about the thoughtful hour every day. What was, the, what was the, especially the part we were supposed to meditate on? Closing scenes, right? Now the question is this, how many of us do that? Do you know there's two things in the writings of Ellen White that I know I've read, there may be more, there are at least two things 
that the prophet of God has said that we are to make our daily meditation. The life of Christ, especially the closing scenes, 1 Corinthians 13. I believe that was methodical because they go together. We see 1 Corinthians 13, especially in those closing scenes. You understand that? It's not about how you love your friends. It's about how you love your enemies. I always say this, and I love it, as, as, as an old school present truther, I used to say, Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Therefore, no bad music, no bad dress, no bad diet, no bad education, no bad Sabbath keeping, no bad. And I, I mean, I was, I was no bad in it. But watch this. God says, I'm in agreement with you. God says, I don't want no bad dress. I don't want bad diet. God says, I don't want bad any of those things. I don't want bad music. I don't want none of that. But God says, but you missed something. And so I'm like, what did I miss? So I go back to Matthew 5. Prior to verse 48, Jesus talks all this language about loving your enemies. Love your enemies, pray for them that persecute you, and do all these wrong things to you if they take your cloak, coat, and give them to this. That Jesus goes into all of this strange behavior, being lovable to unlovable people. So then I'm reading that, and I'm like, hmm. And then God says, now go to Luke 6. So I go to Luke 6, and when I go to Luke 6, it's the same story. Yeah. It's the same exact story of Matthew 5. It's just Luke's account. Yeah. I'm learning that physicians are very detail-oriented. And Brother Luke helps us understand something that you and I would do well to consider. Luke gives the detailed sentiment of God in more clear language than Matthew 5.48 did. Matthew 5.48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. But look at Luke 6.36. In Luke 6 and verse 36, same exact sentiment of verse 48, but Luke gives better detail. Luke says, Be ye therefore merciful, even as your Father which is in heaven is merciful. Hold up. So you expect me to be merciful to the merciless? You mean to tell me you hit my wife? You assault my wife? You hit my children? You assault my children? You hit me and you assault me? And God says, be merciful. Don't be vengeful. Do not retaliate. This is with enemies. Guess what? Did you know your husband's not your enemy? Did you know your wife's not your enemy? But yet we retaliate with our own spouses, with our own children, with our own siblings. Watch this. With our own brethren. We retaliate and we actually think we're on our way to heaven. And God says, you don't even know how to deal with your own family members and brethren. And God says, you, do, you have not even seen what an enemy really is yet. Brothers and sisters, what I... What, what gets us out of this deception? The light that shines from the most holy place. The cross levels things. The cross balances us. It helps us get a right perspective of life and how to deal with people and to understand true godliness because it's not about how Jesus worked with his disciples. That's his highest reflection of love. It was how he worked with his enemies. I believe with all of my heart, the loud cry of the third angel's message is not going to be so much proclamation as it is demonstration. And yes, it is going to be the fact that we will serve according to Isaiah 58. We are going to serve our enemies. We are going to do everything that Christ did when he walked on this earth and we actually are going to have peace in our hearts at the same time because the character of Christ has been reproduced within us. And this is what he's trying to get across to us. And so when I keep going through this, I mean, I'll let y'all look at this another time. We'll go with it. His love was consistent even after being betrayed. This is what God says I want to see in you. I want to see your love remain consistent for your husband, wife, children, family members, church members, friends, even your enemies. I want to see my love consistent in you even when everything goes against you. 
That's difficult. Galatians 6, 14, it separates us from the world. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, in the midst of unwanted duty, the greater good caused him to yield. I mean, there's so many lessons from the cross. I mean, I just started going through this thing. I was like, man, Luke 23, 34, compassion towards the erring. There's so many lessons from the cross. And Christ says, I want this to be the science of all your education, the center of all your teaching, all your study. God says this is what will bring about true change. And it is a miracle. It is a miracle because we're told in the book Education, as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, it says there is awakened in the, in the soul the mysterious power of faith, hope, and love. Mysterious power. You understand that? All week we've been talking about what? Power. It says, as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there is awakened in the soul the mysterious power of faith, hope, and love. It says, upon the vision of Christ, the gaze is fixed, and the beholder becomes like that which he adores. God says, that's what I want to do. And when we start seeing our brothers and sisters fall into sin, we're going to start saying, Lord, we have sinned. That's when the Spirit of God is in you, you won't look at the brethren and say, look at what they are doing versus what I'm doing. Look at my separate organization while that corrupt organization is over there. No, that language won't come out of those who are truly being filled with God's Spirit. Amen. We'll say, Lord, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts. God did it on purpose that we have no recording of Daniel's sin. We know he sinned because the Bible's true. All have sinned. But God did not allow a single one of Daniel's sins in his life to be recorded in inspiration. To show that even when you think you have no record of sin, you need to understand we have sinned. God's wise. All wise. Now watch this. Moses, yeah, it's true. Moses said, and Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, this people have sinned. That's what Moses said. Well, that's not how he finished. It says, they have sinned, a great sin, have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me. I pray thee out of thy book. That's love. That's somebody filled with the Holy Spirit. They did it. But Lord, can't imagine life without him. Lord, please forgive them. And if you can't forgive them, block me out of your book of life. That's love. That's Calvary ordained love. The master, Jesus himself, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Daniel, Moses, Jesus, they're paralleled in this experience. God wants us to understand this is love and this is how it closes. The theme that attracts the heart of the sinner is Christ and him crucified. It says on the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands revealed to the world in unparalleled love. Present him thus to the hungering multitudes and the light of his love will win men from darkness to light, from transgression to obedience and true holiness. Beholding Jesus upon the cross of Calvary arouses the conscience to the heinous character of sin as nothing else can do. Why is it that we veer away from Calvary when it has so much power? Subdues the soul, helps sinners see their sins like they've never seen it. But I, why is this not the theme in our homes? Why is this not the theme in our churches? Why is this not the theme in our proclamations as present truth preachers? I got into the place, I said, listen, you can bypass my messages all you want on audio verse. I don't care. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's like, I'm going to give this message because this is the message that I believe is truly going to help us Amen. cooperate with God that he could finish his work. Yeah. I don't believe we could finish anything. You can't finish nothing. We use these type of languages, but you can't finish anything. It's God that finishes that work in us. And as he finishes his work in us, then it's easier for us to be instruments in his hands that he might finish the work in this world. But my brothers and sisters, I, I speak the truth. My wife and I have traveled a lot of places, sat down with a lot of couples, 
and it amazes me on end how many of us have a profession in the sanctuary, but we are having a very different experience outside of the sanctuary. And I'm serious. We are not meditating upon Christ crucified in the context of the third angel's message. Justification by faith really has to go away from being a theory, but it can't be limited to just a mere external fleshly work. God wants to put his motive in our heart as we do that work so that everything is done in true gospel order. One well-ordered. One well-disciplined family will do more on behalf of the gospel than all the sermons that can be preached. Adventist home, page 32. My brothers and sisters, God is making it very simple. We need our motives purified. The power of the cross of Christ and what he did for us and our meditating on this is what will bring about that conviction, yea, that conversion. And in time, we'll be able to reflect the lovely image of Jesus in a way that even Jesus will be pleased. Is it hard to please men? No. We can make men say amen very easily. But what's most important is, is God pleased? And you know what happens when you please God too much? I hope you know what happens. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says, and Enoch was not because he was translated. And it says, and before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Wow. My brothers and sisters, that's what I want. I want to please him. I want to please him. Why do you do what you do, Dwayne? That I might please him. Isn't that a simple answer? No more of this talk. Why do you do that? Because I was told to. Why do you do that? Because uh, I got to finish the work. Why do you do that? Because if I don't, then I won't get ABC blessings. Why do you do what you do? That I might please him. That's my husband. That I might please him. And so when somebody says, why are you nice to your wife? Why do you cherish her so much? Why do you keep talking about that woman all the time? Why is it that you're always trying to find a way to sneak around to be next to her and to talk to her? That I might please her. That's why I do what I do. I like simple. That I might please her. That's what God wants for husbands and wives. Why do you do that? I might please him. Simple. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is getting ready to come. The final crisis is getting ready to unfold. And God is determined to make sure that he has a bunch of mirrors that are going to be set in place when he comes. A bunch of people that he sees a perfect reflection of himself. May we cooperate with him. Every day, meditate upon the cross of Christ. Bring the principles into your daily practical life. And as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there will be awakened in the soul the mysterious power of faith, hope, and love. And may this take place in your heart and mind. Question, how many of us understood the study? Is it your desire to cooperate with Jesus and let his will be done? Yes. Let's go to our knees and let's seal it with prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful. Thank you again, Lord, for helping us to see the beauty of the cross. There's so much that took place there. We didn't really scratch the surface. If we could especially study the cost of the cross. Oh, Lord, I remember what that did for my heart. Father, I pray, do something special for thy people. Help us, Lord, to really understand Christ crucified, all that took place on that cross. And help us to understand it in the context of the third angel's message. That this took place, that we can demonstrate the highest love to heaven by keeping your commandments. Regardless of threats, regardless of trial, death before dishonor of God and his law will be the Christian's motto. Lord, I pray only love can make people stand like that. Please, Father, put that love within us. 
Help this love to be cultivated deep within our hearts. And then help us to show our love for you by how we treat others. Starting in our home, in our church, and then abroad to others. We thank you so much for these precious lessons. Help us to truly receive it in our heart. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.